The name of the message today is Virtue Ladder, Part 2. We started this last week. There's a type of bamboo in Asia which grows to amazing heights at amazing speeds. Sometimes as much as 20 meters in six weeks. However, before that growth spurt, the seed lies in the dark beneath the ground for up to five years. Those farmers who make a profitable living from the bamboo would have given up long ago and changed crops if they didn't know that plenty was going on beneath the surface despite the fact that there was no outer visible sign to encourage their perseverance. Every bit of watering, every bit of waiting was worthwhile. And in the spiritual realm, the same truth goes. Where there is life, there is growth. We're continuing our series on 1 Peter chapter 1 that we've entitled, You Shall Never Fail. We remember that believers have been given everything that we need for life and godliness. We've been made alive through faith in Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, we see that we must not be content with just having saving faith, but we need to make an effort to grow. It will take our entire life, but we can learn to climb the virtue ladder. Last week, we began to study the list in our text. I want you to look again at uh, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. That's the beginning of the virtue ladder. It starts by faith. It starts by saying, okay, and we're not talking about just any faith. We're not just, just blind belief in something, anything. Go ahead, pick something. But faith in Jesus Christ, and it's a transfer of faith because we all believe in something. You say, I don't believe in anything. Yes, you do. You believe in the fact that you don't believe in anything. Therefore, you believe in something. But most of us start off believing in works. I was talking with someone uh, earlier uh, this week, and they, they said, well, no, I, I never thought I could get to heaven. But the, the question is, why? Because I wasn't good enough. Because you believed in works. Because you believed works was the way you get to heaven. Most of us start that way. Let me try. Let me try really hard. Let me work really hard. Let me go to church. Let me turn over a new leaf. Let me do better. Uh, let me try again. Let me repent really hard. Let me cry. Let me pray. Let me, let me uh, uh, do penance. Let me do something. And then there's that nagging feeling. What if it's not enough? What if it's not enough? And then every time you come to a Bible-believing church, you get overwhelmed with the, the feeling, it's not enough. And then you open your Bible, and the Holy Spirit says, it's really not enough. And you look at the Ten Commandments, and you see, guilty, 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 guilty. As you look, and again, the Holy Spirit says, your works is not enough. You're in trouble. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then we read, 
but God commendeth. That means God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And when we think our works trying to get to heaven, it's not enough. Jesus died in our place. That's enough. So then we get to that point where we say, okay, my works is not enough. Christ's work is enough. I transfer my faith from my dead works onto the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That starts the journey. That is the start of faith. And that takes you from dead to alive. Now, a lot of people are trying to make Christians out of dead people. You know, uh, you could talk about abortion, or you could talk about evolution, or you could talk about um, homosexuality, or you could talk about any other hot button Christian topic, right? And you could you could take out your twenty pound King James Bible, and you could take your unsaved friend, and you just slap that Bible in across his face and say, "You better believe." And all he's saying, "Why I believe you're hitting me with the Bible." But and not doing anything. You say, why can't he understand? Because he's dead. Dead people can't understand. Can't reason with dead people. They need to be resurrected. Well, I can't do that. Good. Now, now, now we're understanding. You can't do that. But Jesus can do that. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, so you tell them the truth. Listen, everyone's a sinner. That sin's enough to send you to hell. But God commendeth his love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And all of a sudden, bing, the light comes on. Oh, I'm dead. But Jesus paid that price. I'm going to ask him to save me. And he asks, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know that sin is enough to send me to hell. But I know you died in my place. I'm going to ask you to save me. And bang, the Holy Spirit comes in. And you are made alive. Man, that's good. The Bible uses the term born again. Now, let me, I, I don't know why. I'm just going to do this. I'm, I'm a little off script today. And it's cool because you can't tell because I don't have my notes up because my notes broke. Normally, I, and normally we are a fancy church. Normally I have, I have stuff up here and most of the time it works but today <laughs> uh, you know I, I had brother I had brother Jimmy look uh, you know and I had I had 60 slides presented for today and brother Jimmy said yeah you have 60 slides right there they're all the same Somehow, when I transferred it over from my program, my program said, <laughs> you know, you ever see, you ever see uh, that commercial uh, for insurance with the guy named Mayhem? I think he got into my computer today. So, you know what? It's okay. God knows what he's doing, and God brought you here because you need what you're going to hear. Amen? And I need to say it, and I'm excited. So here it is. Add to your faith. The faith is what gets everything started. Faith is what creates the life. If you still think that the way you can get to heaven is by doing the best you can, trying the best you can, then all the other stuff that I'm about to talk about is a moot point. The Bible says uh, that the natural man, which is that's what we are before Christ, natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. They're spiritually discerned. So none of this other stuff is going to matter until you trust, quit trusting in works and trust in what Christ did on the cross. But once you do, 
Now you're born again. Oh, that's, that's what I, I'm sorry. That's what I was going to say. When folks think about the, the passage born again, they hear born of water and of the spirit. Nicodemus, right? A lot of folks in, in other uh, denominations, they're told something, taught something false. Born of water means baptism, and born of the Spirit means, I don't know. Let me help you. In John 3, in fact, keep your finger here, we're going to John 3. I don't know why I'm sharing this, I think somebody needs this. John 3. John 3 and... Nicodemus is coming to Jesus in the middle of the night. Verse 2, Then uh, the same came to Jesus by night, said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art the teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles except thou, uh, that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Folks like to jump to verse 5. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And people say, there's your born again. Born of water, baptized, born of Spirit, and filled with the Spirit. There it is. No, you missed a verse. When Jesus said, you need to be born again, Nicodemus' brain started doing backflips. And he asked a question in verse 4 that Jesus answers in verse 5. So before you skip to verse 5, you might better figure out what question Jesus is answering. Yes? So verse 4, the question. How can a man be born when he is old? And enter the second time, into his mother's womb and be born. Because born the second time, born again, means I was already born once. Well, everyone here, no one here was hatched, right? Everyone here has been born once, right? So Nicodemus was asking, how is it possible to be born again, another time? We're only talking about two births. We're not talking about born again again. Two births. And so Jesus then answers the question about, do I enter into my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water, meaning born of your mother, when mom's about to have a baby, what happens? Water breaks. Huh. Does that have anything to do with baptism? Oh, I hope not. There's no baptism here. There's a birthing going on. So, born of water, physical birth. And of the spirit, spiritual birth, you cannot enter in the kingdom of God. So, that brings us back to Second Peter. Salvation starts it off by faith, okay? Now, the Bible says, add, in Second Peter chapter Chapter uh, 1 and verse 5. Beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So, last week we saw that giving all diligence means to make every effort. Okay. If you have faith, if you transfer your faith from your dead works to Christ alone, the Bible says, Whosoever uh, call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? The Bible says, um, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, what? 
believeth in me, should not perish, but have what? Everlasting. Everlasting life. Everlasting life starts when? When you believe. And how long does everlasting life last? Okay. So then if everlasting life is everlasting, can you lose your everlasting life? No, because it's? Okay, see how that works? Bible truth is amazing. So now we're not talking about work out your own salvation so you keep your salvation. We're talking about now where there's life, there is growth. Therefore, if you want to grow in a healthy manner, put all your energy in adding to faith. Faith is what made you alive. Now that you're alive, put some effort into living. In other words, don't be a spiritual couch potato. You're alive, wonderful. And you're just going to be a slug until Jesus comes back? Or are you going to, giving all diligence, add some things to your faith? Well, Peter is saying, listen, now that you're saved, you need to give all diligence. And if you do, look at um, verse 10, the back end of uh, verse 10 of chapter a one, if you do, if you do these things, you shall what? Never fall. Boy, I'd like to have a Christianity where I'm not stumbling. I'd like to have a Christianity where I never fall. Now, that doesn't mean never sin. That means I'm never going to fall flat on my face if I'm doing what? If I'm taking, and taking all my energy and adding to my faith some things. Last week, we looked at adding to your faith virtue. And virtue is moral goodness, an energy of moral goodness. And then add to your virtue knowledge. And that is an experiential, uh, a practical knowledge as you grow. Now, we continue the rest of the steps on this ladder. Verse 6, you have your Bible open in front of you? Add to your knowledge temperance. So, knowledge, then you have been getting practical truth, practical knowledge. Now you add to that temperance, which is? self-control. It's holding, this is from, um, from uh, Wiest, it's holding the passions and desires in hand. The word uh, is used of the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. The Greeks used it of one uh, who has his um, you know, physical passions under control. One can see um, that it's a fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says in Galatians chapter um, 5 and verse 3, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, part of the fruits of the Spirit. Proverbs 16.32. I'm going a little fast. Uh, you can listen. Um, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit, and he that taketh the city. So, to our faith, we've added virtue, a moral excellence. We've added knowledge, practical understanding. Now, we're adding to all this a self-control. Controlling passions whether it's an anger passion, whether it's a, a sensual drive passion. You can turn here, Proverbs 25, 28. 
Proverbs 25 and verse 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Now listen. You say, I, listen, I have faith I'm going to heaven. That's true. But if you don't learn to start adding some things to faith, you will fall. And that fall could be devastating. And it could be fractured relationships, broken marriage, loss of influence on your children, ruined uh, relationship uh, from the church. You, you ever find, you, you ever think if you have to go from church to church to church and every church you keep going to seems to be bad, maybe uh, the churches aren't the problem? Did God really call you to bad church after bad church? Hmm. The Bible says I keep under my body, bring it into subjection, unless by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So we continue our step. Add to temperance, or self-control, patience. Patience is the ability to endure when circumstances are difficult. Self-control has to do with handling the pleasures of life, or temperance has to do with handling the pleasures of life, and patience relates primarily to the pressures and problems of life. Often, the person who gives in to pleasures is not disciplined enough to handle the pressure, so he gives up. So that's why in this rung, this ladder, we start with faith, then we go to moral excellence, virtue, then we go to knowledge, practical understanding, I'm reading the Bible, I'm putting it together, then we go to temperance, self-control. Now that I've learned self-control, I'm starting to rule my spirit, I'm starting to bring things in, I'm starting to not say everything that flies through my head, right? I'm uh, learning to, to slow things down, I'm learning to control this passionate beast that is me, okay? Then I can go to patience. I can stick it out. Flip over to James chapter 2, please. James chapter 2. Hupameno is the word for patience. The ability to remain under, it doesn't simply just mean accept it and endure, but it's a sense of looking forward. It is the courageous acceptance of everything that life can do to us and the transforming of even the worst event in another step on the upward way. James chapter 2, or James chapter 1 and verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That's that same word. Hupameno, the ability to remain under. But let patience have a perfect work. You may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, do we have an example of that? Yes, we do. In Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible said, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of God, the right hand of the throne of God. So consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. That endured is the same word, hupomeno, he remained under, and he did it, and was happy to do it. All right. So, where are we at? 
We add to knowledge temperance, self-control. Now that we have self-control, we add patience, the ability to remain under in the middle of trials and to say, you know what, I'm going to have an energy that, that focuses on serving God and stay right where I'm at. I'm not going to run. I'm not going to squirt out the side. I'm going to stay right here. You say, but things are getting hard. You will never fall if you continue to build and step this ladder. You miss a rung, you're going to fall. And to patient godliness. Godliness is simply godlikeness. You know what it means in the Greek, if you want to break it down real simple? It means, and to patience, or the ability to remain under, worship well. Man. Heard a song this morning. By the way, if you don't do this, you should be like me and do this. I hope you have a routine on Sunday morning where you get your mind ready to come to church. You should, in my opinion, you know, we're coming together for the morning worship service. Man, when, when those doors open up at 11 o'clock, first of all, you ought to be here. And then when you're here, man, you should already have your pump, your pump primed. You've already spent some time in the Word. You've already maybe heard some Christian music on the radio. I, I do that. I listen to some Christian music. Um, there's different, different places you can get it. Uh, today I was getting it from my old radio station I grew up with, WCRF in Cleveland, Moody Radio Station. And I was into that, and I heard this song I never heard before. Was, I will always praise you. And it would talk about all the different things. But the answer is always praise. And I'm thinking, man. And then when I heard uh, what God had already before the foundation of the world prepared Brother Robert to sing today, it connected. Man. So godliness is to worship well. It describes the man who's in a right relationship with God and with his fellow man, and so when it comes time to worship, he can let it go. So, think about it. Faith, okay, I'm made alive. Good. Now, a strong energy of moral excellence, that's virtue. Then, practical knowledge, that's reading a book and learning, okay? Okay. Then after uh, that knowledge or practical knowledge, then temper, self-control. Then after self-control, um, patience, the ability to remain under. I'm not going to just squirt out any time uh, Bertha Better Than You makes a snort in my direction. And then godliness. Now I show up to church and I've, I've been... Um, I've been climbing this ladder, I'm prepared, and when I come, and when I start singing about the old rugged cross, maybe, maybe, I know it's a Baptist church, but maybe you feel like raising your hand, you could do that. Maybe you feel like saying amen, it's okay. Why? Because I've prepared my heart to worship well. Godliness. Add to godliness, brotherly kindness. The word there is interesting. Anybody know what the word, the Greek word for brotherly kindness is here? It's not, it's not as obscure as you think it is. Anybody know? Anybody? Any guess? That's a great guess. 
Now that one's coming at the end. It's a great guess. Uh, agape is, is, you know, well, we'll get there in a minute. Phileo or brotherly kindness is Philadelphia. That's exactly right. Phile it's from the, from the phileo, brotherly love, but Philadelphia is brotherly kindness. So I wonder where we get the city of brotherly love, brotherly kindness. Listen, now we're getting to where the rubber meets the road. But it's interesting. This is one of the top, top rungs of the ladder. If you jump right into the brotherly kindness without making sure you got a foundation of moral virtue and of, um, of Bible knowledge, and of uh, uh, self-control, and of patience, the ability to remain under, and of godliness, worship well, then your brotherly kindness is either going to be fake, surface, or not existent. I don't feel it. You don't feel it, you do it brotherly kindness. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially unto the, those who are the household of faith. Now I want you to understand, the, the lead here is not let us feel good to all men. You know what? When you start to mature, you realize that sometimes I lead with actions, God will give feelings later. But I lead with actions. You want to repair a broken relationship? Lead with actions first. Don't worry about the feelings. Brotherly kindness. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, seeing you've been purified, you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Hebrews 13 and verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, be kindly affection one toward another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. First John chapter 5 and verse 1, whosoever believeth that, God, that Jesus is the Christ born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. What Peter is saying is there's something wrong with a religion that finds the claims of a personal relationship a nuisance. Add the last, letter, last rung of the ladder of virtue here. Add to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, For those of us who are not used to the King James Bible, we're thinking that's weird. You know, we think, when we think of charity now, we think of ding, 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 ding. Salvation Army, it's Christmas time. But 400 years ago, when this word was put in, charity is putting someone above you the ultimate true love. It is from, and Tracy was right, the word agape, which is the ultimate 
self-sacrificing, godly love. There's more to Christian growth than brotherly love. We need to have that self-sacrificing, agape love. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. Right out of the gate, Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's impossible for the fallen human nature to manufacture these seven qualities of Christian character. They need to be produced by the Spirit of God. That's why I spent some time talking about this starts with a saving faith, where we transfer our faith from dead works and faith unto Christ alone. If you haven't done that, then adding all these other things really won't make any sense. But once you have had saving faith, now you have the Holy Spirit, now you have been born again, you have new life, and when there is life, there is growth. When God produces a beautiful nature of his Son, in a Christian, it is God who receives the praise and glory. Because we have the divine nature, we grow spiritually and develop into this kind of Christian character. It's through the power of God and the precious promises of God that this growth takes place. A divine genetic structure, if you will, is there, and God wants us to be conformed to his Son, Jesus Christ. The amazing thing is this, the image of Christ is reproduced in us, the process does not destroy our own personalities, we still remain uniquely ourselves. What a blessing that is. First Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12, First uh, Thessalonians 3 and verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. God has given us an incredible promise in 2 Peter chapter 1. If you do these things, you shall never fall. We've been given everything we need for life and godliness. Now we need to make to the effort to add the steps of the ladder. Lane Adams compared the process of spiritual growth to the strategies, the strategy that the Allies used in World War II to liberate the islands of the South Pacific. First, they would soften up the island, weakening the resistance by shelling the strongholds with bombs offshore. Next, a small group of Marines would invade and establish a beachhead, a tiny fragment of the island that they could gain control. Once they had the beachhead, then they would begin the long process of liberating the rest of the land. Eventually, the entire island was made free. Adam draws this parallel. Before Christ invades our lives at conversion, he softens us up. Problems we can't handle. Getting in over our head. Hearing the truth. Coming under conviction. And then someone opens up the word. We hear of the saving work of Jesus Christ and our eyes open up. And we have life. And God takes a beachhead. And now, the process of making us like Christ begins. And we are now told, look it, 
you can help this process. It's going to happen. You're going to look like Christ one way or another. But start walking that ladder. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or agape love. You climb that ladder, and you do these things, and you will never fall.